So you're going to Kenya, and uh, in Kenya, the idea is that this is a project-based course, and it's uh, all projects are interdisciplinary projects, uh, something to do with computation, with something to do with biology. So the mix can be different. It can be different mix. It can be, you know, a biological question answered using computational techniques, or it can be a computational question with applications to biology. So, for example, a, a program for automatic identification of zebras, individual zebras from photographs, it's a computational question fundamentally. How do you identify uh, in objects in a photograph, in an image? But it's applied to a specific domain of, in, uh, of, uh, of zebras, recognizing individual zebras, rather than face recognition or fingerprint recognition or something like that. On the other hand, uh, so the project, maybe I should first kind of, So first of all, before then we, we get to the project, uh, there is a website. So I should send you guys the website to the class. Oops, I should really <laughs> not do this. <laughs>
which is um, essentially agnostic, hypothesis-free uh, statistical analysis, uh, evolutionary game theory, agent-based modeling, network analysis, not necessarily in this order, but definitely on November 16th, because that's the only day that Ian can do it, collective decision-making. Uh, and we'll talk about visualization. So another instructor in this course is faculty from Electronic Visualization Lab, uh, Jason Lay. And we'll give you a little, maybe a little bit of a virtual tour of EVL, too. So we have several people from Electronic Visualization Lab. These are the people, so electronic, we are now in the space of Electronic Visualization Lab. This is the the premier electronic visualization lab in the world. These are these people. Some of them are specifically these, and more like more sort of generally these people, the ones that are here. There are many rooms here behind us. Uh, developed virtual reality techniques. Uh, the cave, virtual reality cave. So uh, the first one, and then today <clears throat> they're developed working on techniques of seeing 3D without sort of without glasses, just standing there and. Uh, and, and, and since the 3D uh, landscape, for example, of Mars, they worked with NASA on visualizing the NASA missions and deep Arctic explorations and deep ocean exploration missions. So they know how to work with scientists too. Um, they also, one of the first projects that was, did, that was done here by one of the founding members uh, of the Electronic Visualization Lab, Tom DeFonte, who worked with, uh, <coughs> with people in the um, movie industry and uh, artists, real artists, <laughs> was developed. Uh, how many of you, you know, you know Star Wars, the, the, the movies, right? Yeah. yeah? So Death Star was digitally developed here. I did it. In a school. Okay, so we have some geeks there. Good. <laughs> <laughs> So these people, for example, uh, EVL has a very personal relationship with Pixar and faculty. Jason just was uh, at Pixar Studios and they... Um, <clears throat> you guys, when are you going to Adler Planetarium? Oh, you we just went. Okay. So they developed also some of the sort of visualization mechanisms for the Chicago Adler Planetarium and had a very personal invitation to visit the planetarium and things like that. So, so they're the right people to talk about visualization and how to visualize lots of scientific data. And we'll talk more in depth about past projects in the course and uh, sort of the logistics of going there, what is Impala, um, what can you expect there. And over the December, you'll be working, hopefully you'll start thinking about joint projects. So each project, the, one of the conditions of this course is that each project has to have computational and biological component to it. Uh, so ideally each project has both a biologist, a biologist, that's you, and um, a computer scientist. More than one, it looks like. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so, so over the course of the project, hopefully, uh, you'll be thinking already throughout the next three, two months about possible projects, possible questions, and the combinations of um, techniques and, question, and biological questions that can be done. But, but in a more focused way, over December, you really start getting into teams and sort of thinking, proposing projects. So we also can think of what kind of equipment, what kind of stuff we need to take with us to Kenya so we can hit the ground running. Because overall, we're going to be there three weeks total. That includes coming to Kenya, coming to Nairobi, getting to Impala, settling in, and going back. So each uh, Nairobi to Impala and Impala to Nairobi takes a day, essentially. So we have just over two weeks of real, real work time to, 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 to collect the data, you know, do some preliminary analysis, and then uh, do some data correction, collection. Do you have any questions so far? Do you have any questions so far? They've heard the speech already, which is why I'm talking mostly to you guys. So, do you have any questions? No, you're just 
shocked because he's not to just take the truck for apology. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, yes. It says here on the schedule that on the twelfth uh, there is a class only in Bristol, so we are skipping that uh, that week, or we are attending mm. to. No. So uh, next week it's going to be so. So this is mostly for Princeton, yes. Okay. Um, but we are still meeting. Hmm? We are still meeting here. So or, it's going to be perhaps a brief meeting for us. This okay. is going to be sort of just the overview introduction of uh, computational thinking for non-computer scientists. Okay. Right. So just like Princeton guys didn't have to be present during the whole ecology for non okay, <laughs> for non-ecologists. <clears throat> Um, I suggest, and this is purely a suggestion, that you guys do come to the beginning so there is uh, common terminology so you kind of know what they're, what the, the, the stuff that they, yeah. you can expect from them to know. Yeah, that makes sense. But uh, in general, yes, this is next, next week is mostly for you guys. Okay, um, so also on the uh, website, uh, there is the wiki, which we're updating. This is leftovers from last time, but uh, so you can see all the students kind of from last time. There were more biologists than computer scientists last time, uh, but this time it's the other way around. And uh, there is uh, the. But we'll be working, so the main purpose of the wiki, and all of you will have access to it, is to start sort of uh, working on projects. There will be project areas for each one. There's also uh, the blog, which is right now blog from last time. So you can see all the fun parts of last time. But we'll continue the same blog for this year. And uh, um, sort of keeping track. From, from now on already, you, can, you guys can start. We'll, we'll give access to everybody. All lectures that we have have video posted on the website. So there's already video from the introduction to ecology. You guys can see what was there last time, what they know, just like they will know what you know. I think this also is recorded, right? This, yeah. this one. So it is recorded. I will never look at it uh, again myself. <laughs> no, but uh, so it is recorded. So, so maybe, you know, you guys don't have to go, but you can see the video um, from, the, from the recording. Any questions? Okay. So let's, let's start then. What does uh, computation have to do with ecology? And how does it all fit together? So normal scientific process, um, the way kind of it happens, you have a question. Did you have a burning desire to answer? For example, why do animals do what they do? It's not a very specific question, right? It's a very broad kind of question. Uh, and there are many possible ways that you can answer this question, right? But all scientific exploration starts with some curiosity. Why is the sky blue? Why do animals do what they do, right? Uh, why do you, you know, why do this, when I mix this stuff together, why do they go boom? Right. So, you can instantiate this question in many possible ways. And the ways you instantiate this depends on the available tools, your domain expertise. So, if you ask this general question of why do animals do what they do, if I asked you guys, you as a biologist, and if you know, you would instantiate that in very different ways. Right? You can ask, uh, why do animals go wherever they go? Why do they? That's one way. That's if you have sort of background in mobility and resource use, you might instantiate it in, 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 in that particular way. Why do they go where they go? Why are they found in particular locations? Right? That's that's sort of a uh, more landscape or, or <clears throat> resource use, resource oriented kind of question, uh, answer to the question. Instantiation of the question of why do animals do what they do. 
uh, a behavioral ecologist might ask uh, might ask a movement question, but then ask, you know, why do they behave in a particular way? Why do they fight? Why do animals fight with glue? Uh, and why do they groom each other? And why do they why are they nice and why are they why are they aggressive? So that's another version of the question: Why do they do what they do? Right? Um, a geneticist or uh, uh, may ask questions of, of, you know, do different types of behavior uh, are they inheritable? So does genetics? How does genetics control different behavioral patterns, or different actions, or different things that animals do? So maybe we should, you know have that exercise and try to instantiate that question in different ways going around your guys' table. So, so Adam, let's start with you this time, still. How would you instantiate a question? I mean, because I'm sure in your research you have instantiated and, and you will instantiate the question of why do animals do what they do in a particular way. So, does it have to be specific to animals? <laughs> that, no, that's a serious, to like just for this example, okay. For this particular so, example, yes, that has to be specific to animals. May include humans, but uh, humans are animals. Okay, um, my specific question would be why do you get certain grazers in particular plant communities in the Serengeti? So, so that would be a resource kind of specific classical ecology on this question, right? Uh, well, how yeah. do resources, um, the, the distribution of resources affect animal? Um, yeah, and, and mainly the feedback. Like, how do you model positive feedback? That's what I. Oh, you're you're thinking. already kind of going. Uh, you're going here <laughs> and, and and here, right? Oh, sorry. Right. So no, which is good. Which is good. So you're demonstrating. That kind of really demonstrates of how scientists, the scientific process of how we go from a question to an answer in a scientific process way. So, but your your association of the question is maybe in a broader sense of how does resource distribution, how does the availability of resources affect animal, uh, where where the animals go? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Next. <coughs> My, my question would be uh, how do you um, count for the persistence and coexistence of animal populations in the landscape over time? So, <laughs> so, so this is about collective behavior, right? Uh, I, I'm sorry, no, I, I will learn your names by the next time, but <laughs> what's your name? Uh, Diego. Diego? Jacob. Jacob, okay. okay. I didn't hear it. Okay. So, Jacob. Uh -huh. Oh, behavior question. Oh, it has to be a behavior question. No, it doesn't have to be a behavior question. We're trying to instantiate this you know, very broad question of why do animals do what they do, right? So in your in your case, the do part ended up being behavior coexistence, right? And and, and did you say competition or? Yeah, well, but I wouldn't call that behavior necessarily. It's, it's I don't know. I don't know which biogeography essentially. It's not. It's not okay. a behavior question. Okay. Great. So so what was that a, a, about species? Question about species composition. Okay, so 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 um, so for the benefit of maybe a computer scientists, right? <clears throat> the uh, if you were really instantiate the question of why do several different species, why are several spe different species found together um, in a landscape? Can we can we make that in that kind of concrete way? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the, the why do animals do what they do in this case is why do these different species exist together versus others don't? And why do they exist in this landscape? Yeah. So, if you were going to answer this question, you know, 
if you were really seriously, you know, going to answer this question, how would you go about uh, sort of designing your experiment, and, and, and how would you, what kinds of tools would you, intellectual tools, would you would you look to to start answering that question? Um, I guess there are sort of two broad approaches that you might think about using. One would be uh, a sort of broadly comparative approach where you ask about different species of assemblages and try to pinpoint uh, in sort of a mechanistic sense or even just a, a large pattern-based sense what, what sorts of differences you tend to see and, and perhaps why. Or the other approach would be to go in with a very sort of experimental attitude and, and perturb a community in some way and try to tease apart mechanism based on the response to the bird vision. By, by perturbing community, uh, what do you mean by perturbing community? Um, yeah, I mean, it could mean all kinds of things. It could mean anything from, you know, fertilizing it to cutting the forest down to decreasing the size of a patch of habitat to, uh, you know, an experimental warming plot. You know, these are all sorts of things that are pretty... Yeah. Pretty to, pre to perhaps, you know, if you went to the drastic way, removing some species from the, uh, from the composition or adding... Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't. Uh, that's that's certainly drastic in in the sense of you know, or uh, it, it feels drastic morally. I'm not sure how drastic it is in action. Uh, you know. No, but there are experiments right, where you can with, withhold sort of uh, restrict the movement of certain species so they don't interact with the rest of the. Right, so I, I guess I'm, just, I'm not sure that's such a drastic experimental perturbation to make if, you know, when, when you're dealing with a single species out of many, you can, you, there's often redundancies that, that, uh, that you tease apart when you make such, those sorts of small perturbations. Okay, can I ask a question? Of course. Um, I don't want to take us too far track, but to what extent can, um, how, when I think about ecology, I tend to think of it as being more of an observational sort of um, science, and that you can't really do experiments or do perturbations to measure the outcome. But maybe that's wrong. So. That's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how can you perturb an environment without, um, you know, like ethically, right? I mean, Right. So imagine, imagine I go to Impala and I'm interested in what the effects of elephants are on the dynamics of tree recruitment and dispersal. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, perhaps, when, when, when you talk, wait, 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 wait. So terminology, recruitment and disposal, <laughs> dispersal. Okay, so, so dispersal meaning a tree makes seeds and they have to get somewhere else to sprout new trees, so they have to disperse in some way. Um, and recruitment would be the actual process whereby uh, some progeny of a tree recruits, so to speak, in some site and it successfully grows as a tree in the next generation. Progeny means seeds, babies. <laughs> um, so, so if I were interested in whether uh, large herbivores really had a role in, in structuring the tree community, uh, via those sorts of processes, I could put up a big fence that excludes large herbivores from an experimental plot if I wanted to, uh, and and watch how the ecosystem behaves under those sorts of conditions. Right, and in fact, I chose that example somewhat intentionally because there are large ungulate exclusions at Impala. Right, so um, they're like they're kind of right. soft, sort of controlled regions where you can, you know, examine a particular variable. But that's also the value of having modeling, right? Because there are some ethical complications where you can't actually manipulate a, a system and like kill all the animals or give them all a disease. That's wrong. Um, and that's why modeling is pretty cool, right? And something that we are somewhat familiar with, obviously not as expert as you guys, but if you can make a model system of it, then you can play around with the parameters and see how the system will change and then generate a set of predictions and then say, we see this in real life. Um, is this a reasonable assumption? Do these models make reasonable assumptions? Do they have reasonable mechanisms, et cetera? So. Great. So as long as we're on the subject, 
why don't uh, Andrew, right? No. Yeah. yeah. So why don't you uh, give us an example of how you would instantiate the question of why do animals do what they do? Well, I'm gonna stop. What factors promote lions hunting as a group as opposed to individually? Okay. So right. So why do uh, why do why do uh, lions hunt in a group? Right. The, why do they do what they do? Why do they hunt in a group rather than individually? So that's a question uh, coming more from sort of collective behavior, maybe, uh, social interactions, something. So your different backgrounds clearly affect you know, how you instantiate those questions. And of course, availability of data, if you're going to ask questions about lions, uh, you're going to go to Kenya <laughs> or to Africa. You're, you're not going to, Ar uh, to the Arctic uh, because the data on lions are, are, are not available there. <laughs> kind of. Um, who knows? So okay, uh, so 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 how would you uh, how would you then design an experiment, or how would you collect your data to answer this question? I'm not, I'm not sure that we can actually get enough data in two weeks. No, 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 no. We're not talking about reality right now. We're we're gonna so 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 right now we we'll forget a little bit about reality constraints, right? We're we're gonna dream. Dream our dream experiment. If we really wanted to know why uh, why do lions hunt in groups rather than individually, uh, how would you go about you know designing an experiment or or trying to collect data to answer that question? Or it doesn't have to be uh, you know necessarily experiment, but how would you go sort of out there in, the, in, in getting the data necessary data to to answer that question? Uh, you mean specific to the lion idea, or just generally yeah, how Yeah, specific to the lion idea. I guess you spend a lot of time watching lion hunts, both independently for when they're alone and when they're in a group, and try to list both the biotic and abiotic uh, factors that are coexisting at the same time, and then maybe try to make an agent-based model to simulate uh, the same factors and see which ones promote group hunting as opposed to individual hunting. So, so what would you put in, into that model? Into the agent-based model? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I don't know, I think part of that, answering that question would come from having some idea of the natural history. So you, by observing what actually happens in the wild, you might get an idea for which are the more important things. Because I mean, you could put so much detail into that model, which would make it really unwieldy and hard to do. So I would imagine that you spend a lot of time doing natural history observations to figure out what might be the important parameters. If it is biotic, like, you know, it has to do with the type of animals they're hunting, or how many cubs they have, or if there's another competing pride nearby, or something like that, versus the weather or the habitat they exist in. So you would use kind of your uh, maybe intuition and some statistical analysis to figure out which factors are important and which factors uh, are less important. You know, you would you would stare at data for a long time, find some patterns, some relationships, and, and, and try to come up with a hypothesis of what would be the relationship between the distinguishing factors between the high, the lines that hunt in groups with the ones that don't. Is, is that a fair description of the process? Sure. Okay. So um, this is a very, uh, and, and I'm sure if you continue going around the table, you each one of you guys would come up with some version of that question, which you would, you know, keep, uh, depending on your background, depending on your interest, um, you would instantiate it differently, think of different way of, ways of collecting data, even if we focus on lions and why they hunt in groups, I'm sure if we continue going around the table, you guys uh, would still answer it differently. What kinds of data would you, uh, would you collect and how would you uh, go from data to hypothesis? So, <clears throat> but, but the typical sort of scientific, scientific method, the scientific approach and process that you demonstrated so well, um, all of you collected it, <laughs> is that you have some data, you have maybe conduct some experiments, you collect more data, and then your intuition and statistical analysis allows you to generate models, which are hypotheses. Models are hypotheses, right? You maybe play with those models, uh, you, you continue playing, you find relationships that allow you to generate hypotheses about, uh, uh, say, why do animals why do lions hunt in groups rather than individually? And then, once you have those, 
you perhaps conduct more experiments or uh, collect more data and, and that allows you to differentiate between the null hypothesis or between the and, and your hypothesis that you put forward or uh, several different hypotheses and you see which one is more sort of likely in reality. Hopefully some of these hypotheses generate some predictions which you can then go and test in the field and see if that were indeed true, if this is the reason why, why lions hunt in groups, then you should be able to observe <coughs> uh, maybe uh, groups with other particular com if this is the reason that lions hunt in groups, that you should observe groups of particular compositions th that say maybe have more females, more juvenile females, sorry, more mature females and few juvenile females rather than the other way around. And so that's a, that's a prediction generated by your hypothesis of why lions hunt in groups. So then you can go back to the field and collect more data to see whether that prediction holds water, which would support or reject your hypothesis. Right? So maybe one of your uh, hypotheses generated a prediction that, well, if this is indeed uh, the reason that lion hunts, uh, lions hunt a group, maybe you had a crazy idea that <clears throat> based on your data you generated a hypothesis that each lion sees only very small spectrum of the color, right? And so they have to hunt in group to get the whole picture. <laughs> right, crazy hypothesis, fine. Uh, <clears throat> if that's the case, then you should be able, what is the prediction from, what is the prediction from that hypothesis? That a, uh, mm -hmm. a single line alone would be, perhaps only be able to uh, hunt a prey of a specific color? Right, so, so then, then somehow you should be able to say that a single line only would focus on a particular color spectrum and would only see the world in that color spectrum and should not be able to see uh, anything of different color spectrum or differentiate. And you could go and maybe go and show to lions like, you know, uh, squares of different colors and see what, you know, the, whether the reaction is different. Eh, you know, maybe a little bit dumb, but pretty straightforward. <laughs> Okay, so that hopefully then your 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 field analysis, field more your your field experiments would reject your hypothesis. You know, that lions, the reason lions hunt in groups is because they see the world in different in, in increments of color spectrum. Okay, and so in general, in science, we never actually answer the original question uh, with hundred percent certainty. We never we cannot come back and say, here is for sure the reason why lions hunt in groups and not individually. The best we can do typically is come up with enough evidence that says, well, it's plausible that this is the reason why lions hunt in groups. It's very likely that this is the reason, but not for sure this is the reason. Because maybe, you know, uh, uh, 50 years from now, somebody else will, co will, will collect different types of data and, and uh, reject your hypothesis. But one of the things that, that, that the way sort of the scientific process works is you put, you know, you put these hypotheses forward and you have more and more evidence to support your hypotheses. And, you know, it seems likely, but nothing is 100% sure. The only thing that is sure uh, is that you can on occasion reject your hypothesis because it generates some predictions that data just do not support. So okay. is the corroboration versus falsification process? Right. So, so you, you know, th there's a philosophical argument right. about the whole scientific process uh, and whether this is the case or not, but most of modern science kind of follows mostly this uh, you know, Prost version of uh, 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 <coughs> falsifiable hypothesis. So far so good? So far, so good? Okay. So where does computation come in into this whole thing? Well, it comes in at several stages into the whole process. I mean, we can, we can you know, let the scientific process be as it is, and for, you know, many hundreds of years, scientists did just fine without us, <laughs> without the computational uh, component of it at all. You know, did some computation by hand, maybe on occasion needed, you know, better statistical software to do the statistical analysis. Uh, but all it is, the statistical software, is 
just you know does faster what humans can do anyway. So there was no fundamental conceptual shift in bringing computation into the process. So what can computation do? This is sort of my view of what computation can do. Um, Could you define computation? Like I, I don't know what it means when you say computational ecology. We will. Like what does computation mean? I'm about to do that. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. So, uh, computation and computational methods is something that has to do with a computer. But that's, uh, that, that's both too broad and too narrow. Statistical packages, then, is computational, right? It's a computational methodology. I don't care about that kind of computation. <clears throat> so, Computational approaches, to me, uh, and the ones that we focus on a lot, is something that... Okay, we'll, we'll come to that in a second. So, what we can do, in addition to just staring at the data for a while and trying to find relationships using our intuition and maybe statistical analysis, uh, we can abstract the question even more, or pose it in a you know very uh, direct way. So Emma, you suggested okay, I can maybe look at all the biotic and ab abiotic factors, uh, throw everything into it that I can possibly think, right, and find some relationships, find some patterns in those data. So if you're doing it based on sort of your intuition, it's one way of generating hypotheses. If you're doing just basing on, oh, you know, these seem to be important factors from my knowledge of the natural history, from my knowledge, from my understanding of the ecosystem, from my understanding of the process. That's one way of, you know, and, and domain expertise is very important in this, to, to find those patterns, to find those interrelationships, to find the important factors that affect behavior. The other way of doing it, perhaps, would be to Say, so, okay, here are all the possible factors. You know, is there a way to find all patterns, all relationships between uh, hunting in groups versus all these other factors? Right? So, and then from there, is there a way without you know, me looking at it, without my knowledge of the natural history, is there a way of finding then uh, which factors affect the behavior, the result in, collective, in group behavior versus the ones that don't result in group behavior. So one could envision a, an experiment where you collect those data on group behavior and with all the biotic and abiotic factor, factors on, uh, on all different species predator of predators that hunt, those who hunt in groups versus those who don't hunt in groups, those who hunt in large groups versus those who hunt in small groups. Uh, not only that, you have a time machine, so you can go back over the life history of, uh, of lions, right, of the evolutionary history of lions, and you collect that, the, all those factors uh, all the way back from you know the, the origin of group group predation in lions, and just before that too. So you would have tons of data. A lot of it is probably irrelevant. So the question is then, how do you find the relevant factors that resulted that affect uh, group behavior that result in this in this group hunt hunting pattern versus the ones that don't? That's where that's one approach where you can so you can pose this is here's all my data here are all my data and I want to find you know on the one hand I have all the factors that I can possibly think of for every species that ever hunted in group or alone and all the instances of a hunt you know, and what conditions it occurred, what time of day, how the stars were aligned, and uh, you know uh, uh, how the animals were feeling, 
and what kind of prey they were hunting and uh, everything else. On the other end, on the other side is, was it in group or not? And so then you want to find a statistically significant relationship between the factors uh, that describe the hunt and differentiate between the group versus not group hunting uh, behavior. Right? So you pose then the question, rather than using your intuition and finding those factors, you pose it as a kind of, here's what I have, here's what I want. It becomes an input-output pair. Right? It becomes, and here's my input, all the data that describe the factors of uh, a hunt versus uh, whether it resulted in a group hunt or not group hunt. On the other, and, and you want to find the factors, the, the, those factors that correlate in a statistically significant way, perhaps, one way to pose this, to the group versus non-group behavior. So you specified both what you have in terms of the input and the data and what you want, want to find in those data. Right? So now, once you have that, once you have this input-output pair, we can then perhaps design a, a way to, to, a computational way, and in this case I mean on a computer, in a principled algorithmic way, to go through all those data and find those relationships, statistically significant relationships, factors that result in group versus non, differentiate between group versus non-group hunting behavior. So, there are two things here. Computers can only do what you ask them to do. So you have to tell them, I want from these kinds of data, these kinds of questions, these kinds of uh, patterns, this is what I want to find. A statistically significant relationship between factors and group versus non-group behavior. The other thing that happened here is there were lots of data and computers could do it without knowing anything about the natural history. But implicitly, you did bring the knowledge about the, uh, the natural history there, the knowledge about the population, because you said, here are all the factors that I could care about, possibly. Right? The particular shade of green on the grass doesn't really matter, so I didn't collect information about it. On the other hand, he also said, you know, I care about group versus non-group behavior, hunting behavior. So that's implicitly, you're bringing the knowledge of what constitutes a hunting behavior, or what constitutes group versus non-group behavior. That's where your domain, domain constraints come in, and that's where your abstraction of what does it mean to, have, to differentiate between group versus non-group behavior comes in, because you pose it as a statistically significant relationship. So, once you've translated your domain expertise and your question into those sort of mathematical terms and posed it as an input-output pair, we can then use design sort of algorithms, programs, and let me pause here for a second. So, you guys, the Princeton side, uh, when you hear the word algorithm, what do you mean? What do you um, see? What do you think? So, uh, it's sort of a formula for, you know, when you see this, you do this, when you see that, you do the other thing. Um, so either in, in an animal behavior or in, um, in, you know, in computer science, so I, I think, uh, you know, like an if statement or for loop. Um, yeah. okay. Anybody else? Like a recipe? Yeah. Right. So if you look in the dictionary, then um, an algorithm is a set of instructions, step by step instructions that achieve a particular outcome. Okay? So a recipe, 
a cooking recipe exactly is an instruction, is, a, is an algorithm. Um, you guys do, do you have examples? Hmm? Hmm? No, examples of algorithms. Oh, algorithms. Yeah. Like out, outside computer science? Or outside computer, computer science. Well, uh, a very simple algorithm. The algorithm. Can you hear? Well, an algorithm that you're probably familiar with is the algorithm for long division, which is taught in school. Yeah. If you have to divide numbers uh, with more than a uh, 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 digit, uh, you, you know how. You know, uh, you know how, how to do long division, right? That's an algorithm. You know, isn't the, the long division, right? You know the, the long division. The, 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 the dividend. The, the okay, uh, long division is okay. <laughs> okay, so that's an algorithm. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, I have to get my uh, tire today. So I have to fix my flat tire, and I have a little piece of paper in my patches box that told me step by step how to do that. So tire patching is a bicycle, hopefully, not the car, right? Yeah. So uh, a set of instructions, right? So IKEA comes with an algorithm for building IKEA furniture comes with an algorithm for building uh, for building uh, your bookshelf. Hopefully, you follow. If hopefully everybody who uses it will come up with the same outcome. <laughs> Not always the case, but hey. So. So it's a set of step-by-step -step instructions that achieve a particular goal. So so from for. The, Mostly when we talk about computational approach, it means algorithmic approach. Something not only, uh, not only something that can be done on the computer, but also it's a sort of algorithmic step-by-step uh, -step way of solving, of going from the input to the output. So it implies that you have that specified input-output pair and there is an algorithmic way of going from the input to the output. The outcome of this approach, then. Sorry, you're a little bit crackly over here. Is the, can you use the microphone, maybe? To, uh, that was the wrong place. Yes. Uh, so you said that, that it was crackling? That's yeah. better. Yeah. Better. OK. So I think it was the fan of my computer. <laughs> so, so the outcome of that process, and in a minute we'll come back to this. It's not the answer to your question, and you know, in com in computational biology, it often comes that you know we think that you solve the problem computationally, you you solve the problem. This is it. This is the answer. It's not the answer to your question. When we reconstruct evolutionary evolutionary trees, right? So there is the whole phylogeny reconstruction, big big part of computational biology. Here's a set of extant uh, DNA sequences uh, of extant uh, organisms. Uh, we want to reconstruct a phylogenetic, build a phylogenetic tree, um, you know, <coughs> under maximum likelihood of parsimony assumptions. It's not, we don't know that that's the actual phylogenetic tree, but it's not, not we don't know that the actual uh, evolutionary tree, right? It's a plausible explanation of those data, but short of having a time machine, we'll never know that that's the true answer. So we can't actually guarantee that that's, a true, that's an answer to the question of what's the actual evolutionary tree. The best we can do is provide one, a good hypothesis, which then still has to be tested just like any other hypothesis. It has to be supported with evidence. Good, the big advantage of computational approaches is that they typically are particularly good at generating predictive models rather than only descriptive uh, or explanatory. Then they actually particular computational approaches are particularly bad at generating explanatory mo uh, models at all. Humans generate explanatory models. Computational approaches generate descriptive or predictive models. And so if you have then this model, it's a hypothesis which you can test, just like anything else. So it's just one more way of going from your data, from your experiments, from your trying to answer that question to a hypothesis that hopefully answers the question. So is this, is this like the model that Ella was proposing, where you take, you predict behavior based on an agent-based model? Is that 
that the same so kind of thing? agent-based model is is another way. It's one particular computational approach, right? So okay, but mm -hmm. but like that that was the idea that you sort of make a model that makes predictions, and then you go into the field and you test those predictions using experiments. Actually, in, in agent-based modeling, you create the model. So computer doesn't generate a model there. Computer generates data, which is a hypothesis coming from your model. When you do agent, when you use agent-based modeling, you're the one who puts the model into it, right? So you you already so so in fact, agent-based modeling is not a particularly great example of computational approach uh, of solving a, uh, of answering a question or generating a hypothesis. It's probably hmm? you disagree. Okay, it's a tool. Okay. Where, where Ian, we can't on. hear you. Could you come closer to the microphone? The, the field has gone way beyond that point of, of just making toy models. Nowadays, what we do is we extract the interaction rules from the data, and there's a recursive feedback between the agent-based models and the data. Like, so we can, in, not, in unbiased ways, we can actually extract the interaction rules from real data, implement that in a simulation model, and have this close feedback loop. So it's as hypothesis testing, I think, as many of these other hypotheses. Another, another point I want to make, I have to go sit. Anne told me this, mm -hmm. this run, that he goes sit, so the students tell me it runs a bit later. Mm -hmm. But I don't want that. I don't want to be dead. I have to be No, I, um, I, I, I know. I know that you're next to it. The other question I have with this idea of just taking lots and lots of data and looking for correlation is, well, you know, I can find correlation between climate change and a number of pirates. <laughs> Are they as strong as the model, but as, you know, as, as, as the warms, the, the number of pirates on the planet is going to decrease? And it's very predictive, but it tells us nothing because I, I, I put the wrong variables and there's no cause and effect. So I think, I think it's very dangerous to sort of take automated techniques, take lots of data, and then find statistical correlates because you will find statistical correlates. I absolutely agree with you, Ian, and I actually don't disagree at all. Um, in, two ca in both cases, first of all, it generates a hypothesis, so you still have to test hypothesis. Certainly, machine learning, which is what this approach of taking lots of data and finding statistically significant relationships, and we'll talk about machine learning, is only one way, one particular methodology of doing it, and it's, it's, you have to use it with a lot of caution. It doesn't tell you what's, what's good relationship, it just tells you a statistically significant relationship. It doesn't produce anything in terms of explanation of your data. It just finds the patterns. Uh, inter right? The, so, so I totally agree with you there. And the other part about agent-based modeling, the modeling itself right, doesn't extract the rules. What you use to extract the rules is, is a step beyond the modeling, the agent-based modeling. So I totally agree with you there again. Um, that oh, no, we, we, we use the technique for adaptive force matching, which is exactly embedding the agent based models in the data <coughs> and extracting the rules. So, testing, rigorously testing hypotheses by, by, by I, I can explain this to you. Um, and and I, hope, I hope you do it, do it for everybody else because we actually have on, on this side, uh, so Alessandro is coming uh, from the AI background and uh, sort of that. Did you, Maybe I can talk a little bit about that on the decision making. Right. Day, like how and how the, the computational techniques we've developed that allow us to actually extract interactions without, uh, without bias. Right. And that's a perfect example of so if you just you know, create an agent based model by just embedding your particular, your particular, you know, you have a model in mind, you create an agent based model that simulates that model and let it run for a while and see what if that's, you know, that's very basic use of computation, but, but not a very, perhaps, you can get more creative, as Ian, you just pointed out. You can use that as a basis and see what you did not put into that model explicitly and whether that model tells you something more beyond what you put into it explicitly and generate, and that's where you generate hypothesis using that computational approach uh, that you still kind of have to test. Um, outside of sort of so the microphone. Huh? The microphone's backing up again? The microphone. Okay, is that yeah. 
Um, so, so, and we'll talk about a variety. So, just uh, you know, agent-based and extensions of agent-based modeling and automated uh, reasoning and uh, artificial intelligence um, and, and machine learning. Those are some of the examples of computational approaches that kind of come into this process and create a different way of going from data to hypothesis, which and then ultimately to to plausible hypothesis that answer your questions. So, yeah, I'm still there, <laughs> or you kind of have to go. So, um, is that something? Um, so, 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 um, you do you still disagree? <laughs> no, I, I agree that, that we have a series of tools, um, right. but I, I always disagree with the agent-based modeling. I, I think that whole field of agent-based modeling is, you know, has been probably updated in the last few years. Um, I agree. I, my, my point was that if you just put a model and use that, that's not, that's, that's not the type of computational approaches I'm, I'm uh, uh, kind of describing here. But what you stated, that you then use that model and infer the rules that, you, that are beyond there, the, model, the, 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 the explicit model that you put into it, that's a computational uh, approach that generates hypotheses. And that's kind of computational question that we will be talking about. And you know, I definitely hope that you'll bring them up and um, when you talk about decision making and whatever, or whatever you're going to talk on November 16th. So great. So so computation in this whole scientific process, the main point is computation. The role of computation is kind of to generate hypotheses, not in, for the most part. And computation works by having input output pair, you have to you have to tell it what's your input and what's your output. And and computation can get you from the input to the output, computational methods and solutions. But they cannot they're not open ended. Uh, computational approaches do not produce open ended answers. They cannot tell you uh, this is the biological meaning of that answer either. That's the human has to do that. The human has to translate from biology to the abstract and from the result of the computation, abstract computation back into biology. So here's an example. Um, so, so I'm going to answer, uh, to, to, to give a very specific example and sort of demonstrate a very different computational approach. Uh, Camilo, this is shortest path if you want to know. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, so suppose we were interested in another way of asking why do animals do what they do, and we kind of touched upon it, is why do they go where they go? And if, in fact, Adam, we were interested in um, uh, resources, and why do animals go to particular resources, right? One, one way to ask that question would be, um, do animals actually have memory? Do they remember where different resources are? Right? Yeah. Do they go to the water so when they're thirsty? Do they just go to the water? For that to for us to know whether they just go to the water, they actually we have to uh, assume that they have memory where the water is, right? And then well, unless you wanted to test it with like a random walk to look at you know okay. if you. Uh, they start or they like water at a distance. Yeah. Right. So perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. So that's exactly uh, you can you can your your basic assumption is if they have no memory, they just then they just wander about until they stumble upon water. Right? Right. And then you would never leave it. Right. And then your evidence of that behavior would be you know, a particular type of path that they take. Right? If they did have memory, what would you expect to see if they had memory, good memory, and, and sort of a view of the entire landscape? Wait, if they the entire landscape, why do they need memory? Okay, let's back up. If they had memory, if they had, if they had some memory of where the water is, and they're somewhere on the landscape at this point, and they know they have to get to memory, to memory, to to, to the water. What kind of paths would you expect? To directories. Mm -hmm. You expect to take directories. 
direct routes uh, within the constraint of the landscape, hopefully. <laughs> right. So what does it mean to have a direct route? What does it mean for you to have a direct route? For example, the shortest path that's reasonable, if they learn a path, you expect them to follow the path that they know. Okay. Great, so we have a shortest, uh, so, so by, uh, thanks, thanks for staying, and it, it, does it mean we'll see you next time on November 16th? Uh, yes, yes, I may, I may uh, pop in one of the other days, depends on my schedule. Okay, well, um, okay. stay in touch by email until then. Will do. Okay. Will do. Bye. So, so uh, what does it mean a shortest path? Uh, suppose, suppose you have um, kind of, uh, these are different locations that, you know, animals spend a lot of time. Not only that, these are kind of the, the, the different ways that you almost have to go through. So these, these uh, circles, you can only get, we have this very particular landscape where maybe there are mountains and whatever in between and there are just narrow paths from one point to another. And so these, 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 uh, uh, these circles show these points that you can get to, to and the, the length of the most direct route, the direct route from one point, say from start S to this point two, six, seven, and so on. Okay, and then the water is somewhere there, and so these numbers are the length of those direct paths. What do you mean then that the most direct path from S to T? The animal right now is at S, and it needs to get to water, which is at location T. Well, for example, a uh, colony of ants could very quickly solve that problem um, just by you, all you need to do is work out. I mean, by shortest direct path, I mean the path that it takes the least time to get from A to B. Consistently. Well, that's one unit of length. What's the direct path in this situation? Oh, the direct path? Sorry, I'm short sighted, I can't see the direct numbers there. <laughs> it's the hypothesis. Okay, it's the hypothesis of triangle. Hmm? It's the I, what? I'm, it's, I'm assuming it's the root through the middle. Is that what you mean by one for me? Yeah, okay, it's the root through the middle. Have you looked at this? Yeah, I'm afraid I can't see the numbers in the circles from here. It's a long way away. Oh, S6, oh. <laughs> Say that out loud? I, I can't see. Oh, okay, so uh, maybe. Uh, uh, um, the most direct route from S to T is going S65 to T. Is that what your question was? Oh, no, it's not uh, 7 to T. 7 to T, is sure? Better, is, is this better? Ooh. That's 15. <laughs> Oh, right. oh yeah. are you seeing that they're distance measures? Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they're distance measures. <laughs> okay, scale. They're just so not to scale. No, it's not to scale. These are just, you know, this is, let's not say, let's say it's not distance measure. This is how long, this is how long it would take to traverse this particular part of the path. Maybe it takes, you know, the path is so precarious here that, that it takes a long time to go through from here to here, but you can really zip through, you know, from here to here in 14 minutes versus this would take you 13 minutes to, to, to go. So um, if those are the, the time units, you know, what would be the most direct path from S to T then? 7 to T, through 7. Uh, no, no, that's the three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 52 all the way around. Okay. Well, okay, suppose you're the animal that starts here. What would be your kind of... So if, you're, if your animal is an ant, sure, we can just send them, just flood them, right? Just everybody, part of the colony will go there, 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 then they'll, you know, they'll start exploring, then you go there. Uh, from here, whoever came here will split and so on. So whoever gets past up there, hopefully they also have a memory of how they got there. What if you're a solitary, you know, what if you're a reasonably solitary zebra and you're starting at S? How would you, how would you get to T? 
Well, if you've never been to tea before, then you're going to have to do it by trial and error a few times before you learn the route. No? Okay. So, so that's a. Um, suppose you knew, you remembered. Uh, sorry. Uh, suppose you remembered that there is a very fast way uh, of getting. That it would, you don't remember the whole thing, but the fastest way of getting to here is through six, not through two. Okay? So, so and that's as much as you remember. Uh, how would you proceed from there? Well, so like, one question is whether I even have the conceptual apparatus to know that it's better to go to three. You know, what, what sort of spatial map do I have at all? Right. And so that's that's... Perfect. So depending on, you know, so we can really test how much of a memory and spatial map, sort of cognitively, different animals have by the evidence of their, uh, the routes that they take and how they explore the space, right? So what would be the evidence then, let me ask now the computer scientists here, what would be the evidence of the fact that animals actually have the entire uh, spatial map of the landscape in their head. They can wait, 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 wait. <laughs> this is for computer scientists. Yeah. They always take optimal routes. So they always, the answer was they always take optimal route. Um, what do you mean by the optimal route? The shortest. The shortest, the actual shortest path. So we need to find a way of actually finding, given this, the shortest path, so we can compare what animals do to the actual shortest path. So there is an algorithm <laughs> developed in 1970s uh, by a guy called Dijkstra, uh, who who was a Dutch, who was from from Netherlands, but ended up in uh, University of Texas Austin. It's a famous algorithm taught in every introductory computer science co course. In fact, I just taught it two weeks ago <laughs> to, to my introductory computer science algorithms course. So how do you find... So here's, remember, a computational solution means you have an input-output pair and you want to find a way of going from that input to the output for all possible inputs of that type. So my input in this case is a set of these circles, which we call vertices or nodes, and, and uh, connections between them, which we call edges, and uh, numbers on those edges, which represent some form of the length of time uh, that it takes to get from this point to this point. So it's a network or, you know, it's a network or a graph, with, this is what sort of we call a graph. Um, the other thing is a plot. <laughs> so it's a graph um, with vertices and edges, and you want to find the shortest, in terms of the sum of those numbers on the edges, pass from S to T. So the input then is an object like this, a graph of, node, of vertices or nodes and edges with weights on the edges, and the output is the shortest pass from, two specif from specified vertex S to a specified vertex T, and the shortest as measured by the length, by the sum of the numbers on the edges that, that are taken, consecutive edges from S to T. That's a path. So now, if you give it to the computer, we want a way of finding it, and that's an algorithm. So there's a shortest path, uh, shortest path algorithm which you know, starts with this vertex and builds, iteratively builds the shortest path, um, the shortest path information to, to, the, to the neighborhood, to the explored neighborhood. So it literally does what the ants do, what you suggested the ants would do. So it starts with this vertex. This is, what, this is all I know at this point, that, the, that, that it, the length of the shortest path from S to S is zero. Now I'm looking at all the possible ways I can go from here. And I'm saying, okay, well, the shortest path to this vertex now, I start with, my, my idea is 
is to the shortest path to everywhere it takes infinity. But now I know it takes only nine, uh, nine units of time. Okay, and it takes 14 units of time to get here and only 15 to get here. That's the best I can do. So that's an algorithm. This is an algorithmic way of solving it. Now, of all of those, I also know that the node I can get, the vertex I can get fastest to from from the blue explored path is here. And so this is my sort of the basis for all shortest paths from uh, uh, so far, because if if I can get to here, I, I know for a fact that I cannot get to, to this vertex 2 faster than 9. I may be able to get faster than 14 to here and faster than 15 here, because maybe I have a, a, another edge from this vertex of length 1 that will bring me here. But I know for a fact that I cannot get faster than 9 to here because it would have to start also from S, go somewhere else, and have a shorter than nine path to that other intermediate vertex. So this is how we prove, and we have to typically prove, that with the computational solution that we provide actually works. So this was, you know, uh, there is an algorithmic way which we can code into the computer, but, but the part is that there is an algorithm that, you know, explores the graph and gradually builds information about the shortest path from S to T. And it turns out that the shortest path from S to T is S to 6 to 3 to 5 and to T. Okay? Because, how do I know this? Because I have a provably correct algorithm that for any graph will give me the sh provably shortest path, optimal path. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Um, how do you, cons like when you're writing this algorithm, how do you constrain it to like these different paths when it's tallying, when it's tallying them up? How is it not taking like just uh, minimum distance? Maybe that's a silly question. Because because there is a particular property, so it keeps on this kind of blue region. And what is significant about this blue region is that the length of the short, the length of the path from S to every vertex in that blue region yeah. is, in fact, the true shortest path. And it maintains this invariant at every step of the algorithm. And okay, okay and the way it builds extends this, this uh, blue region, guarantees, provably, you can prove it mathematically, provably guarantees that whatever you add to it, when you add a vertex to it, it's guaranteed to have the shortest path from S to T. So now, you know, I have now all the vertices here, 2, 6, and 7, provably this you know, 9, 14, and 15 is the length of the shortest path to them. Okay? So far, so good. Yeah. Now I can look at every word, every edge that sticks out of this blue region, right? And those are the possible vertices that I can reach from in the next sort of step of the exploration. And I can say, okay, well, if I take, so I can reach vertices 3, 5, and t directly, right? Yeah. So, I think what Adam is asking is, how does it interpret the graphical form, or do you actually have to give it the distances? Yeah. Can it read the picture directly? Is, I think, what No, okay, was. great. Oh, maybe. There is, there is a date, okay, it's a great question. How do we translate from data to representation of data in the computer? So, what the, the, the internal representation of this kind of data is called data structures. So, there are data structures and there's a whole sort of research that goes into how do you design good data structures that allow you to represent a picture like this and then how do you construct algorithms, design algorithms that use those data structures 
to execute, sort of to find, to answer questions about these objects. And there are more than one way, there is more than one way to have, a, to represent this particular uh, picture in a computer from a matrix form, which will take, tell sort of, it, the matrix will be of all vertices by all vertices, each row and each column is a vertex, and a, a, an entry in that matrix, IJ's entry will be, uh, if exists, the length of the edge from I, from vertex I to vertex J. That's one way of representing this. There are a couple of alternative ways, and in fact, uh, the data structure that the most is the most efficient for this algorithm is not the matrix data structure. It's the you have you would have a list of all the vertices, and from each vertex you would just have sort of a set of pointers that will link all the other vertices that are, that are directly reachable from that vertex, together with the length of those uh, edges. Okay. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Right. And so, so this is an example of sort of the algorithmic approach. The computer doesn't know about the fact that you want to test something about the memory of a combination of animals. But once you pose this question as in, what's the shortest path? If I know this landscape, then it can answer it. We can design algorithms, right? So now it will produce the shortest path. Moreover, you can ask the you can ask a computer what would be the shortest path if I only can hold not the entire landscape but only the immediate neighborhood in my memory, right? Because for this shortest path, the algorithm the, com the computer had to have knowledge of the entire landscape at all times, kind of thing. So what if the memory is not sufficient? What if I constrain the memory? What would be my shortest path? What's the best I could remember? what I, I could do. Computer can answer that question as well. And so now you can I'll read it. That question. So if it can only remember one thing at a time, that's possible. Then what that would take. So instead of remembering the entire graph, the entire um, network of roads, what if I can only remember at any point just the things that are sticking out immediately of like one vertex, only one, the one that I'm currently in, and nothing else. And if I want the information about everything else, I have to backtrack, always, okay? And I can't remember at all. Once I come back to the same vertex, I can't remember what I, what I had before. So can I still find a, what, what kind of path would I have then? It would be a very different answer, and computer can find it, right? Because you constrain the resources, you constrain what, what information you can use at every step of the algorithm, and it would be still an algorithmic solution, and it can find the best, the best shortest path within those constraints. And you can compare that shortest path to what the animal is actually doing. And so you, you can ask what that would tell you different constraints of, on memory and different constraints that you can put on what, the, what possibly the animal can remember from just the immediate information to the entire landscape and comparing the optimal computational answers to what the animal is doing you can find the best match between the memory constraint and the path that the animal is taking. And that would provide a hypothesis. So now let me ask you, what kind of a hypothesis? I, I, I'm asking the computer scientists because uh, that's sort of, I'm hoping that you guys, biologists, can answer that question easier than computer scientists in this case. So, so I'm asking the computational questions I'm asking of you, biologists, and I'm asking the, the biological questions I'm asking of the computer scientists. So, so we learn how to talk to each other. So suppose I've, went, I've gone through this exercise, right? I've, I've found all the optimal paths for each level of memory constraint. And now I go back to the field and I, and I see what kind of path the animals are actually taking. So what is the hypothesis then that, I can, that, that they would generate using my different shortest path algorithms? Yeah. <laughs> so go 
going back to that diagram, right? Uh, my, my goal in all this exercise, my, my, my really burning sort of scientific question was, how much can animals, rem can, can animals remember, right? How much memory do they have? How big a uh, view of the landscape do they have? Uh, and the data that I can collect is, what paths do they take? Maybe I can make them really hungry, or I know when they get, sorry, thirsty, or I know when they get thirsty. And so then, then I'm assuming that at that point they're going to water from wherever they are, and I can see what path they're taking to get to water. So now, uh, how would I use my computational tools of the build, you know, being able to, 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 to find the shortest path for each level of memory constraint um, to answer the question of how much uh, memory of the landscape, how much, how big of a view of the landscape to, do animals actually have? So we can go to the algorithm and make it forget, for Sorry. example, or make it remember only the last five um, information. So we can go to the algorithm and modify it to make it remember the last five pieces of information, the last five, well, let's say, um, patterns of animals. And test um, and test this algorithm on the same data that we have on animals. Mm -hmm. If they, if the algorithm and animals have the same, uh, produce the same results, basically, then we say the animal remembers five. Locations. No, we don't say that the animal remembers five locations. We do. That's exactly the thing, right? That's where the, we we have a hypothesis that the animal probably remembers only the five locations. Maybe the animal right. remembers the right. more right. locations. Right. <laughs> or maybe it got lucky. Maybe it remembers less, but it kind of yeah. got lucky, right? right? To rule out the lucky issue, you just have to carry out a statistical analysis of how... Of what? Many, many observations, many okay. animals. So you need to go and collect more data on more animals, right? And to do this process over and over again. And then you would have and that many animals that took many times these different paths, and you can see how much memory would it, what's the best memory constraint that matches their paths, right? right? And then you can do statistical analysis about the significance of those matches. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, guys? No, yeah. I think that, uh, yeah, it makes sense over here. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so this is an example sort of of using the computational a very different non-statistical computational analysis to answer a very biological question. So to, to, to do this loop from the, from the data to the hypothesis through the computation. Okay, so uh, what time is it actually? 5.21. Okay, so maybe this is a good, a, good, uh, a good place to pause and to stop this. Um, and and uh, the one thing about shortest path, I, I just want to, to uh, give an example. So you can actually conduct these, these uh, kinds of experiments, and they were conducted. Uh, the thing is, as humans, we often are very bad at finding the actual shortest path, even though we have the whole view of the entire landscape, the whole view of the, road, of the, net, uh, the network of the roads. And you yourself were, you know, you saw just how difficult it actually is to do that in, in this particular example, right? When I asked you, what is the shortest path here? Um, it, you, nobody actually saw this one, right? <laughs> the, the S to 6 to 3 to 5 to T. It's not a trivial task. Humans are, are, are really bad at that. <laughs> The, the scale, the scale does confuse you. <laughs> right, right. So the scale is confusing. We also tend to have more sort of local approaches. It's hard for us to actually uh, have this global approach of finding the global shortest path because we are very strongly, and, and there have been experiments that have been done on humans. We're very strongly influenced by local information. <laughs> we tend to look sort of for for. You know, okay, well, you know, maybe, maybe a, a, a path that has two, uh, two edges is a good one. Um, you know, so we compare this to maybe this and, 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 and maybe that. 
and, and it's been shown in many different instances that, that, that for problems that require global optimum, humans are particularly bad at finding those. Uh, we, we really look for local, local solutions. So one, one example of finding a short... What? What? To, to actual, uh, to computers, for example, to algorithmic approaches, to algorithmic solutions that actually find the true optimum. So, uh, in terms of the shortest path, in the 1960s, a, a radical uh, social uh, sociologist, uh, Milgram, who worked at Columbia University, conducted this experiment where, <laughs> oh, you know that one, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Do you know the Milgram's experiment, guys? No, so, so he, no, so he, he uh, <coughs> Milgram tried to figure out how connected, sort of how socially connected the humans are in the entire population of the of, uh, United States. So he sent, you know, he sent these envelopes hundred envelopes to people in South Dakota, if I'm not mistaken, or somewhere else, like in the mid randomly chosen in the middle of nowhere. From him, his point of view, it was South Dakota. And the envelopes contained instructions that they had to be routed, eventually delivered, to a lawyer in Boston. But you can only make this delivery at each, each time you can only hand this envelope or send this envelope to somebody whom you know on a first name basis. Right? Right, and so people did this, and at the end, these envelopes actually did reach the, you know, the, the, this lawyer in Boston. And Milgram was shocked and surprised, kind of, to find that these envelopes took at most six hops. Right, and so that's that's kind of the, the, the six degrees of separation came. So so there was this this you know concept that. People in the United States are separated by very short paths, very short social paths in this network, social network of, uh, that would be like this, but, but social network of human connect connectedness, of somebody you know on a first name basis. Um, and, and, it, and it was, it dominated human psyche for a long time, that, that really truly, you know, the six degrees of separation that humans are connected by very short, short uh, social paths, right? Guys, by the Princeton side, right? Right? No, no, no. <laughs> Here's the. <laughs> Here's the piece of information that is often omitted from this description. Only 13 out of the 100 envelopes actually came to Boston. Or they stopped because people were too lazy to send them on because that would happen. So we don't know. There are many problems with the experimental design, right? <laughs> there are many problems with the experimental design. So isn't the problem, sorry to interrupt you, but I think isn't that the problem that we don't know uh, what person to send the envelopes to next? You know, right. There might be a path to the envelope of the person that's not right. So, so we really, there are many problems. One is that we don't know the actual, uh, we don't have the map of the entire social network of the United States, so we cannot do the routing to find the social path, the, the shortest path. The other problem is um, that, uh, the, the, that humans are lazy, the experimental design is bad. <laughs> Not everybody follows the instructions. But, uh, the experiment was repeated with the. Uh, the experiment was repeated on the on the on Facebook, and there was the six degrees of separation. And it turns out that that uh, six degrees is not the true number. The number is actually much bigger than that. But so because short, there are long shortest paths. In fact, there are, there are very some humans are just not connected. Period. So the, the length of the shortest path is infinite. The oh, yeah, so it depends on the system, right? So, I mean, the whole of America is going to be different from the whole of the world, which is going to be different from the Princeton EEB department. Exactly. And right. so, and so, but even when humans do have this map uh, of the entire social network of whatever, maybe Princeton EEB department, 
we are notoriously bad at finding actual truly social uh, shortest paths. So humans typically, even when they're given the, 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 when they think that they know the social network, they still do not find the shortest path very well. So, um, so this is kind of maybe the, the, the final <laughs> I think that, that computers are better at tasks like this of finding Optima, finding the, the, the sort of the, the correlations, finding sifting through lots of data or finding the, the, uh, so the, the optimal solutions where there are many possibilities like in shortest path. But all they do is just it's kind of, you know, it's kind of an interesting paradox because we built these things that can do it. Right. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> we created these algorithms that can calculate it and figure it out. So obviously the capacity is there. I just think the fact is that you know we don't need the shortest path. We're not like. Uh, I, I don't think Wait, hang on. Can I just ask a question bringing back to field ecology? Mm -hmm. Generally? Right. Um, these these uh, methods seem great if you have a ton of data. Field ecology and ecology in general is known for the fact that we have to do a lot of things outside and things get really messy, especially with field data. We don't get very much. The reason we have to be here for five years for a PhD and we have to start the summer is because we have to collect data. We won't have enough data to do anything if we don't start right away. Um, so as we don't need to talk about it now, but it'd be nice to hear what kind of options you have when you are very you have very little data, uh, of what kind of right. techniques you can use to actually find patterns and stuff like that, and then limited data. Right. So actually, this network is very little data, right? <laughs> but right. Uh, yeah. but but we'll see examples. First of all, you collect. You just don't realize how much data you're collect. You're actually collecting. You're collecting right. a lot of data, and we'll see the right. projects from last from last time. Even uh, the, there is a lot of data that you're collecting. You don't need that much data for, to answering, uh, for answering a lot of these questions. We'll see examples. We'll see examples throughout. Um, but so the, the one is you collect more, a lot of data. Two, we can help you collect more data with some of the uh, things that are more automated data collection approaches. And then they generate too much data, and then you kind of have to use the uh, computational approaches to, to do that. But also, um, one of the things for this course, and maybe this is for the for, for both, um, when biologists and computer scientists typically get together, there is this view uh, that biologists, so computer scientists typically have a tendency of viewing a biologist as as pet data collectors, while the biologists have uh, the view of computer scientists as pet programmers. So one of the big outcomes from the course is that, in, and as these computer scientists will tell you, all computer scientists have gained a lot of respect for the data collection process. <laughs> well, hopefully, and well, and yes, we have it on video. The, the biologists have gained uh, respect for the sort of computational approaches for answering questions that go beyond just coding up things. Also, biologists like to do more than just data collection as well. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, right. And so, so there is this, and, and I think good things happen only when there is mutual respect for the expertise uh, of sort of each field with the ability to communicate uh, across the fields. And so, so one of the one of the big outcomes for me, at least from this course, is seeing that uh, sort of happen, and 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 uh, seeing how the different expertise can come together to produce knowledge which goes beyond the ability of any one field on its own. So that's great. But yes, I mean, we have a lot of respect for data collection process, and uh, and and. Uh, Field biology, in particular, the data collection process is intense, which all of you will see in Kenya. So you have to think very well before you collect those data, and you guys are used to it. You Princeton guys are used to it. What is what data are you actually going to collect? <coughs> because most of the time, you get one shot at doing it, and Victor can tell you how miserably it can fail. <laughs> yes. Um, and Carrie can tell you how messy it can be, even when you collect a lot of data. Yep, always. 
right? How, so it's not a matter of quantity, it's not a matter of quality, it's a matter of really sort of thinking of what's the question, how you're going to answer, what kind of data you need for answering it in that particular way. Okay? Yeah. Well, any other questions? We should get started. Um, I mean, start using the wiki or. Right. We should. So, so. Um, so have, um, mutual communication. Right. So, Alessandro is our uh, webmaster. So he maintains the um, he maintains the the website. So updating all the videos and stuff like that. But he also wiki yeah. will kind of get give you the information about the wiki. So Alessandro and Chant is natural. Okay. Uh, Natural people because Chant already has administered the password. But, um, yeah, I know because I think that if we want to start thinking about the project. All right, so if we want to start thinking about the projects that we might want to do, maybe not necessarily, but it is likely that uh, the um, suggestions may come from Princeton side, from biologists. Because they have to propose a problem, and maybe someone of us that is interested can say, "Oh well, I have an idea about that," and blah blah blah. And maybe start building up teams and all that. So I think that the sooner we start, the better it is. So I think that yeah, we might set up the wiki and give access to everyone. I mean, we have a wiki. It's can, set up. Can it's you make an email list that we're all on? Yes. Like a like a Gmail chain or a group that right. we can all join. Yes, yeah, so we communicate through wiki and through email as well. Um, we have all of our emails all together. So, uh, we, we have an email list, but uh, but we actually are going to insist on uh, either wiki or Google Docs. Okay. And the reason why it's just email is not good enough because you lose the trail very quickly. And I was saying it like as in addition. So that we have, yeah. we're able to contact everybody. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that like on a quick, like email list kind of instance. Yeah, the email list instance. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, why don't you collect your emails and send? I have them? it. I have it. I'll send it. Oh, all there. All there. Yes. Also, can you do you have somewhere that's listed exactly what kind of facilities we have? We have no idea about what we can and can't do. Oh. Like, no clue. Zero yes. Clue. And right now we do. A lot of us have to go do stuff. Um, we have other commitments we got to go to, so is there a way we could get access to this online or talk about it next time? Or something? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, uh, if the website itself, if you, it, you know, it has under the logistics, uh, we'll, we'll post, we'll collect information about Impala. Impala has description of its facilities. Uh, we'll put things up there, maybe, uh, of what kinds of stuff. Actually, whatever equipment you can dream of, we probably can think that, that you know, uh, if this that's not true. That's no way. this that's far not in advance, true. this far in advance, I, I'm talking about about sort of uh, automated data collection. This far in advance, within the constraints of about ten thousand dollars, I was about to say, uh, plus what plus whatever AVL has already. Uh, all right. So, so yeah. So whatever you can dream of within about the constraints of ten thousand dollars, plus whatever EVL has already, which is includes all kinds of fancy, Im you know, imaging and uh, uh, scanning and whatever equipment, we 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 can bring. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and there will be information on the website and through the email coming through about sort of the logistics of communication and stuff. Great. Nice meeting you guys. Okay, bye. Nice. Bye.